Good morning, everyone. We're going to get started. Uh, we only have about uh, 40 minutes, and this is a massive topic, as you can imagine. So we'll try to do this uh, justice. We have four amazing panelists here. So my name is Jean-Claude Bouzard, and I work at Digital Promise. And um, you know, there's a general consensus that uh, student well-being matters, uh, and not just because it's a nice to do, right? Um, there's a ton of work being done on research on why this topic is, is important. But what is really emerging is an understanding that if you really want to have the kind of um, substantial student improvement in academic outcomes, you have to have a, a whole child uh, focus on the work that you actually do. The fact is that the, um, the whole child work, the research demonstrates that if you want to have the academic improvement, you've got to focus on that. Um, We've had in these conferences at the GSV, SU GSV, a lot of discussions about the why um, and the what around what this is. In fact, my, my amazing spouse has been on these uh, StageX conversations about the research behind this, et cetera. Pam Kentor, for example, is another you may have heard from, Jim Shelton, a bunch of folks around why. This panel is a bit different. We're gonna focus on the how. Uh, I think this is where practitioners are today, is that we, we get it, we understand, but tell me how to implement this in my system. If you are technology companies, tell us and help us understand how we help systems implement this work in a way that makes a lot of sense. So today we have four real life practitioners um, in different parts of our ecosystem who will be talking to you. Um, you know, Christina was in the last uh, panel um, from Turnaround for Children, um, an amazing organization. Sujata Bad from Transcend Education. To be transparent, I chaired the board of Transcend. So lots of connections for me, for me there. Jennifer Hodges from KIPP Chicago, um, amazing organization there. And Sunil Gundaria from Age of Learning. And he, I think his claim to fame is, is ABC Mouse, right? Um, my five-year-old is obsessed with, uh, with, his, with his work. So thank you. So uh, why don't we just maybe just jump in and get started. And I'm gonna start with you, Sujata. Um, and the question I think is, is, is short, but it's substantial. How do you develop and grow a whole child model? Thank you, Jean-Claude, just that little question. Um, so I think I may talk about one particular elementary school and how they develop the model and how it's spreading and scaling. So I think the, the story I want to give a tell is uh, Van Ness Elementary School, a DC public school. Um, is Cynthia here? She was at the conference. I wasn't sure if she's actually coming to this panel, but the principal of the school may show up, in which case she knows so much more about this than I do. But um, Van Ness had been closed for nine years. Um, and parents in that community had been going up to 10 miles around DC to take their students out of the community. The parents lobbied to open this school up and Cynthia was brought in as an experienced administrator uh, to serve this school population and build the design of the school with the community from the get-go. And so this is a school where it, the neighborhood is about 60% African-American, students are about 60% African-American, diverse about 40 to 50% Title I, um, and teachers reflect the community, so 50% African-American. And everyone is at the table in designing what the approach is going to be. And it kind of, it, it, they base themselves on three core principles. First and foremost is student well-being. After that is student-driven learning, and the third part is students as makers. And these all work together so that students start to see themselves as having agency in redesigning, whether it's an object, whether it's the, the administrative offices of the school, they get real world projects and then see like the DCPS uh, construction team come in and make their design real. Um, whether it's thinking about systems, like how are they fitting into the, the macro conditions of the community, um, George Floyd, like how can this all be part of systems that students feel they have the agency to think about, feel, and change? Um, and so Van Ness has been, since the, over the last six years, very slowly and systematically building a model. 
So it's not a point solution here and a point solution there, but they started with student well-being. They developed almost an RTI model for student well-being that had different components. Um, the, the students, uh, the, the faculty noticed that there were some students who weren't responding well in the morning. There were lots of sort of acting out. So they took design thinking processes and interviewed the students to learn what was happening rather than go straight to discipline, which is where things usually move. And what they found was that the sensory stimulus in the cafeteria was creating an overload for these kids. And so the kids were responding in relationship to that. So from that, like they designed breakfast in the classroom, created safe spaces in classrooms, taught students techniques for self-regulation so that they could remove themselves from any situation where they felt threatened or felt overstimulated and before acting out, could go to that safe space on their own and in those safe spaces were books that they had created for themselves earlier in the year that showed them where they were loved and how they liked to calm themselves down. So you can see how then agency started to build from this, as well as this notion of, of being able to tinker and change the world and change systems, and including themselves as a system. And so Van Ness has been doing this work carefully, slowly, thoughtfully, in partnership with Transcend, because in a, in a way, this is R&D work, right? They're doing research and development, research and design, and teachers are doing their full-time load, and you need a partner to help you then design the, the actual codification of the practices that you're finding effective. Um, over the course of time, other DCPS schools became interested in this, so they've started to run cohorts of five, the first cohort was five DCPS elementary schools that are adopting parts of this whole child model. And now they're in their third year of that adoption where adults are learning this together, they're figuring out how it will fit into their local context, but the core spine of it is codified so that everyone doesn't have to reinvent the wheel. And now that's also spreading nationally. The Navigator schools here in California are adopting it. Perea Elementary School in Tennessee is adopting it. It's starting to move towards Texas. Um, and so it's, it's a whole process that really treats education as R&D work and as, as tinkering, and that brings the whole whole human approach, so adults also participate. It's almost like fractalized in the same way. Adult well-being is important, adult learning is important, adult voice is important, and if everyone feels like they're part of this whole experience, it starts to become a kind of virtuous cycle that gives ever more agency and ever more capacity and belief in the ability to change the system. Just a couple follow-ups. Follow um, so. I love Venice. I had a chance to visit, I think maybe two years ago. Uh, really brilliant work. Um, two things. One, you talked about how that model, that work, um, in fact, if you can find Cynthia, she is here. Um, supposed to have a, a cocktail with her tonight, so we gotta find her. Um, she's brilliant. But what she's designed, um, I think the, the, the message in your piece is that this is not a program within a school. This is a school, right? It's a whole way of thinking. Um, you talked about how this is cascading from just one school to many schools across DCPS. Tell a little bit about how they're trying to translate what is what seems maybe tacit and organic in a school from an amazing leader and support from Transcend to really informing the larger system. Can you say a bit more about how that is being, so it's not just like the codification of that, but how do you transport that to a larger system? It's a great question, and that's always the, the, the question we're trying to figure out. You have this one gem, and how do you actually spread it? So in some ways, what Transcend does is really try to codify the DNA of this so that if, like for example, the morning practices that we were talking about, that is codified as something called Strong Start. And there's documentation around it that includes text, it includes videos, it includes frequently asked questions. Um, and so when the DCPS cohort decides they want to adopt Strong Start, they can come and visit the school, but they can also watch the videos. They participate in a community that is adopting together so that they can ask each other questions, they can problem solve. It's a very strong community of practice. Um, which then allows the codification to become more sophisticated because now it's not an N of one, but we're learning like what happens in an N of five. And then you modify the codification so that it becomes more 
applicable at a broader level, and that continues. It's a continuous iteration process, which is what we need so that schools continue to adapt to the changing people inside them and the changing circumstances that we live in. Yeah, thank you. And at the same time, a system that has to, to enable that to actually Indeed. happen. Indeed, and critical. DCPS as a central office has been very yes. supportive yes. of this. One last, one last quick thing too, is as you walk through Van Ness, as kids come into the school, you see basically a really design process, even in the entry, yes. where students move from the traumatic brain to the executive brain. So really deliberate ways of how adults interact with kids as they walk into the building. So thank you. Sure. Um, Jennifer, I want to go to you, to you next. Um, uh, Keep Chicago has a whole child initiative focused on seven priority areas. Uh, would you please outline what these are and how Keep Chicago is operationalizing these? Sure. Um, so Keep Chicago's priorities, the whole child initiative, is rooted in becoming an anti-racist organization. We have seven priorities that are all working um, in an in interconnected factor or um, process to support students, parents, and teachers, social emotional well-being overall. I won't give all of our progress to date because I'll take up all the time and I want to share with the panelists. Um, but I will share that our progress to date um, has, well, well, what I want to elevate is more around um, our community um, priority, which is centering homes, uh, making sure that our students' um, well being starts at home and making sure their homes are stable. So, what we've done um, is offered 13 weeks of content for our parents to explore career um, aspirations um, or, or thinking about other educational opportunities that they may want to pursue. Or even if they have a record and they're not sure how to navigate the next career uh, transition or whatever change they want in their life overall so that they too can live a life of choice, we've been able to do that. The other aspect of that is ensuring that they have the resources that they need for um, uh, for their basic needs, right? So you think about if a family is not able to provide food for, for their household, that means your student is coming home hung or coming to school hungry, which means they're not able to learn and concentrate in, in class. So we've provided um, food pantries um, at one of our schools and our goal is to expand across all of our, our network of schools overall. We've also provided um, a school-based healthcare center where students and families have access to free um, mental health support as well as medical needs. Um, so the goal is really to remove all barriers of access to our basic needs overall. Um, social emotional support is one of the priorities we're really proud about. We've adopted Yale's ruler training where all of our teachers have gone through this training. This year all of our students will go through the same training and the goal is to really build empathy between our teachers and our students in the classroom, but to also create, um, as Shinjata shared, um, self-regulation tools. We serve 87% African-American students all on the south and west side of Chicago. So they're experiencing a myriad of traumatic uh, experiences overall that where they need, they need the tools uh, to be able to control the situations and be able to control themselves um, should other um, situations arise. And so that is one tool that we've been able to implement and provide um, meditation and mindfulness practices in the classrooms as well. Teachers are important. We know that happy teachers mean happy classrooms. So in this aspect, we've um, ensured that our teachers were able to share what they want, like what, what is most important to them so they can bring their whole selves to the classroom. And so uh, there's been 13 uh, workshops that we've been able to lead this year where our teachers are able to discuss what it's like to be a black father during this time in the classroom, what it's like to be a member of the LGBTQ plus community and support students in their classroom in the same way. So creating shared learning um, across, you know, we have eight schools, so across the schools, um, but then also building that connection with our students so that they can also see themselves um, in the teachers, you know, that they're, they see every day. 
Um, and then last but not least um, is our um, critical race history. So we're in, in implementing the 1619 curriculum. Again, we're supporting 87% um, African American students and it's important to us that our students know their contributions to US history. So we're implementing 1619 in the fall and being able to um, ensure that the teachers, so through our hiring practices as well, our teachers are a positive reflection of the community that we serve. We've taken a very dedicated approach to ensuring that we're hiring the right teams, the right teachers from the communities that we serve overall. The overall premise of this, and I can go on more, but I would love uh, for each of you, this is a shameless plug, but <laughs> it's not shameless, it's a happy plug, to, to sign up for our whole child review. It's where you can learn more about each of the priorities and the work that we're doing. But the whole premise is that we want our students to be able to live a life of choice and, and learn about themselves from a place of empowerment and not from um, deficit in any form. So how, how big is KIPP Chicago? We have 3,000 students, uh, eight schools, K and K-8. It's important to understand the scale, so folks understand it's not one school, but really uh, multiple schools. Um, I also have heard, and I'll paraphrase, that this work without an anti-racist lens is, uh, what's the expression, social emotional learning with a hug. Uh, oh no, so, uh, Racism with a hug, or something like that. Uh, really terrific um, push. Um, I also hear within the construct a focus on identity de development. Um, can you tell a little bit more about why these seven priority areas? Why not eight, why not six, why these seven? So similarly, we took a full uh, assessment, right? So we took a similar uh, design-centered approach where we were spoke to all of our t the teachers uh, that were teaching our students, um, student voice as well, um, and just raise what were some of the most important priorities around like moving from a quality education but supporting the, the whole student overall. So these were the priorities that that you know were elevated, right? Ensuring that our students had access to food. Our students were coming to school. Some of them were coming to school hungry. So we knew that that was a, a motivation that we would be able to make change on where that would impact and positively uh, affirm our students overall. Um, you look at media, right? So you look at the uh, negative portrayal of African Americans and Latinx um, communities, individuals um, in the news. And you, you're thinking about what are you, we would be remiss to not address the real life experiences that our students have on a day-to-day -day basis and not include them in the content overall. And so we knew that identifying a curriculum, designing our own curriculum that would you know, elevate them and affirm their identity overall was, was par was paramount, and I can only speak for myself, right? I'm from Detroit. Um, I lost my mother when I was really young. I was raised by my grandmother, and so sh like we didn't talk about mental health, right? You you grieve, you mourn. I found art, so that was great for me. But there are so many people who aren't able to um, I look for or um, be okay with finding therapy, and so being able to at least if you can't find a therapist we can at least provide resources for our students where they can, you know, if they have a similar experience to me, that they would be able to have the tools that they need um, in order to, you know, to be their full selves in the classroom. So one, one last piece for you is, um, in terms of, of making something like this work, what is the internal work that you have to do with staff and leadership? Lots of communication. <laughs> But the great thing is that we have buy-in from our CEO who has uh, April Montgomery Goble, who has, this was her brain, her brain child. Um, so, you know, I always think about the top-down approach, right? If the CEO and leadership is on board, then it usually flows through. Um, but I would say that um, our team is also really commi committed to doing not just a top-down, but a bottom-up approach, if you will. Um, so ensuring that there is buy-in, so there's multiple surveys that um, I've submitted and, and required of staff to get their feedback on what it means to support them. Um, surveying parents, like what is it that you really want? What's important to you so that we can reverse engineer and provide content that isn't 
um, dictated, but it's designed and um, I would say directed from, from their true desires overall. So what I'm hearing is not, again, not a program, not even a whole school approach, but a whole community approach to really supporting young people. Um, one, one last question for you. Um, I mean, KIPP is known as an organization that doubles down on academic work, and the results, frankly, are, are there for folks to see. Why this pivot? I'm sorry, say the last part? I mean, why this pivot toward the whole child? Oh, so I, I don't think that you can have a quality, you know, I said this earlier, but a quality education is great and it's necessary, but a quality education alone isn't enough. Black and brown individuals um, experience a number of barriers towards access, whether it's academic, it's just general everyday experiences. And, you know, you think about the being able to retain information when you're experiencing trauma, those two, those two don't, don't match, right? And so I say that we're able to provide the, the support of supporting both the left brain and the right brain, the whole child, the, 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 the household, as well as the community, because one isn't successful without the other. Just remember the um, the, the quote. Um, it's so it says, "Whole child without a racial equity lens is white supremacy with a hug." Oh. So now I remember it well. So thank you for focusing on that, um, Christine. I'm going to turn to you uh, now. I'm going to look at this to make sure I'm saying this really properly because Turning Around does a lot of work in this particular area. So we know that Turning Around for Children uh, pulls from basic research on the science of learning and the science of development uh, to build a whole child design framework um, and the Align Whole Child Design Inventory for educators as well to assess their practices, mindsets, structures, et cetera. Would you please describe this inventory and how practitioners are using it? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think one of the things that we think a lot about at Turnaround is closing, closing the knowing, doing gap, right? We've had decades of research about um, the best conditions in schools. Um, there's been decades of research about how kids learn and develop, but our system was, was developed in a different time and for a different reason. And it was developed with structural inequities, as uh, Jennifer was just talking about in terms of um, supporting kids for their presumed place in life, as opposed to unleashing the potential, seeing the assets in kids and developing those assets in kids. So what we've been doing, we've been on a journey to really look at that research and how do we take that research and make it simple, accessible, and actionable for educators. So our goal is really to empower educators. Um, they know their context best. Um, they know their kids and their communities best. And how do we provide them with tools and resources that can unleash them to do that? Uh, to the question you were talking about earlier is like, how do we get this to scale. Um, I think this is something that so many of us want. Educators have wanted for a really long time, but it's like that gap that we experience. And the system um, is holding us in place, and how do we sort of break, break down that system? So we've created the Whole Child Design Blueprint, um, which makes sort of like all that research kind of in, into a simple visioning tool and a framework. And like folks have been saying, it's not a program, it's not a solution, it's not a checklist, but it's a way, we, we talk about it, it's a way of seeing the forest. Here's what we know. Here's what we know about the necessary conditions that support student growth, development, and thriving. And here are some core practices associated with those that are research and evidence-based that we know um, can help get schools on a pathway. Schools are in, in different places of adoption of this, but there are multiple entry points. There isn't one entry point, a one size fits all, but here's, here's a way to enter into this um, that's right for you and your community based on your strengths and your, your assets. So I'm just gonna tell you the, the five parts of, of, the, of the blueprint and then tell you a little bit about the inventory. So the, the blueprint starts at, at the center is really having a whole child purpose so that the community has a clear vision and a commitment to a whole child education for kids, the community gets to decide. The community is inclusive of the educators in the schools, the students, parents, families, and communities to say, what is our vision for student success? What's important to us as a community? And really rallying around that. And so we have a holistic picture of students. It's not just about reading and math test scores, uh, which has been really dominant in the last 20 or so years. But what do we really care about for kids? What do we think is going to be best for, for their future? And kind of starting with that really clear picture. Surrounding that, we call it the big three. Um, it's creating a 
supportive environment, so an environment filled with safety and belonging for kids. How do we create that environment where they're physically safe, emotionally safe, identity safe um, in, in school? How do we create developmental relationships that really support kids in, in, in finding themselves and their identity, bringing their whole selves to school, and how do we integrate knowledge, skill, and mindset building into that? So there are those three components that kind of come together to create the experiences for kids that unleash their potential. And then surrounding that is what we call shared leadership and ownership. Um, this isn't one person, it's not a school leader, it's not a teacher, but it's shared, that, starting with that shared commitment, here's our collective responsibility to the change, and how do we initiate this change and continuously improve toward that change? I think both Jennifer and Sujata were talking about that as well, right? It's not a, this is not a quick fix. <laughs> this is a journey that we're on to dismantle those structural inequities and create something new and different that's asset-based um, and values each individual student in the building to help them find their, their, their purpose. So we try and make it that sort of really simple, here's the forest, here's all the things, here are the trees in that forest, and say, okay, what's your pathway into this? We don't want people choosing a solution um, here's an answer, right? So we, we know a lot of things work and are good. Small schools work, advisory, community meeting work. But instead of picking the solution, here's the thing we're going to do. It's like, what's our pathway to this big picture? What's the pathway to the whole forest? And how are we going to get there? So we talk about incremental change towards transformational outcomes for kids. So one of the ways to, that we're trying to make that be actionable so people can choose an action, choose a path, not a solution, is we have a whole child design inventory. So we've taken those core practices there are 13 core practices within those five components that I mentioned. Um, and schools can evaluate uh, where they are on each of those core practices. Where are their strengths? Where are their weaknesses? Where, where are their places that they, that they can improve? And what's their pathway through this um, to, to, that, to that forest, to that whole child design and development for all kids? Um, and so the inventory is designed to be done as a, as a whole school community for people to have, again, all of those voices represented and to say, Here, here's where we are. And we know, depending on where you sit in that small community ecosystem, you have a different picture of the school. You have a different insight about what's working and what's not working. So together, their shared collective knowledge can say, okay, here, here, here's, our, here's our profile of strengths and weaknesses. Here, here's where we are. Here's our jagged profile towards whole child design and development, and let, let's pick a, a pathway together. We also have a whole child design inventory for the classroom teacher where they can look and say, okay, here's, here's the school, here's where we are as a school, but what, what's it like in my classroom? How's the integrated um, developmental practice in my classroom? And we also have a student version. Um, one of the things that we found, uh, we were actually working with Kip NorCal, um, and we had the teachers um, and all the staff look at um, evaluate themselves against these criteria, um, and then we had the students do it. And the profile from the staff and the profile from the students was actually quite different. Um, and what's really important, like what, what that tells us, right, is it's about how kids experience the environment that's important. It's not, well, we put advisory into place. We did this. But it's like, how are the kids experiencing that? Is that coming through in the kids' experiences? Um, and, and so let's look at that and let's think about a different, let's have that 360-degree view of the school um, and then decide where to go. Um, so schools um, within districts, individual schools are doing this and starting and initiating that process together. Um, and we like to say it's designing with, not for. So we're, we're doing this together and we're going to continuously improve and we're going to say, what works in our context? Like, okay, if we adopt this practice, if we implement it in this way, are we seeing the effects of that? Yes or no, and that's okay. Like, okay, maybe we need to tweak how we did it. We didn't fully engineer it and integrate it into what we're doing. Um, or maybe it's not right. Maybe it's not right for us and the strengths and, and who we are as a community. And how do we think about a different entry point that we can get to that to get to that place? And so, although we have 13 core practices that are science and research based, it's not about those five, those 13 things. It's like how are they coming together? And so, I think oftentimes in education we think more is better, um, but it's like. I don't think it's more, it's like how do we put these together in a way that creates that supportive environment with deep, rich relationships that are integrated with the skill and mindset development for the kids. That was terrific, thank you. Um, so thinking we have a number of superintendents who may be in this room, who I know are in the conference, um, who are really interested in this work. So if they were to get started, and again, school, schools will be opening now in, in the near future, there's a lot of concern about trauma, around well-being, et cetera. 
if you were to give advice to a systems leader, but how do you enter this company? Where do you start? I want to hire children for children. How do I start? Yeah, I, I, exa exactly. Like this, we're in a very unique context, and we have been for the last year and a half. And how do we how do we come back? How do we build back better? Let's not just go and do the same things we did. Um, I think our natural inclination in education, unfortunately, is to have a deficit-based perspective and to say, I can't even think of how many times in the paper, all the educational publications we read, we talk about learning loss, gaps for kids, we talk about remediation, and so we talk about like the adults being in the power and filling kids up and filling those gaps for kids. But what we know is that that's not gonna engage kids. That's not gonna tell kids, we respect you, we value you. We know you were learning this past year. Maybe not what we typically learn in school with the standards that we have, but you are learning. So we want kids to come to school as their full selves and partner with them and say, okay, how do we do this together? And, um, and so I think that, so the thing I'd say as well is that we wanna be thinking about two things. We wanna think about what are the conditions that we're creating as the adults in the system and how is each individual kid showing up in the system? We know that there has been a lot of trauma and adversity this past year and kids have experienced that differentially. And we know that black and brown kids in particular have been hard hit um, economically in their communities as well. And so we have to look at each kid in the system and say how's each individual kid doing? So how are we creating shared experiences for the kids and then how do we personalize for the kids so another tool that that we have that we're really encouraging people to think about using and doing is a well-being index so how are, how's each individual kid doing it helps you understand the kid how the kid is feeling and how that kid is functioning um, and to say because we know there can be a gap in between in between those two things or they could be equal and to say okay how are the conditions we're creating supporting increasing kids feeling and functioning and success in school and doing this together with them not to them um, and fixing things for them, but welcoming them in as who they are, as their authentic selves into school and saying, Let, let's build this together forward that's gonna meet everyone's needs. Thank you, the big, the big sort of headline is, don't walk into this as taking you an implemented program two weeks from now, but really it's a journey to the implementing. Uh, Sunil, I really wanna to go to you and have you enter the conversation. So, um, My Math Academy, um, your program, which was launched a few weeks ago, has earned Digital Promises product certification for both research-based design and learner variability. Again, big topic that we can table for now. Um, will you please describe for us what My Math Academy um, is and how it aligns with the whole child learning? Sure, sure. Um, so with My Math Academy, we want to start with like the genesis of where we came from. And as a company, we're focused on, or our mission is to ensure that all children achieve academic success and develop a lifelong love of learning. And when we, and we had a lot of success, as you know, Jean-Claude, you mentioned ABC Mouse, but we knew we could do more and we wanted to have more impact. And my Math Academy is the result of, as Sujita talked about, R&D, six years of really looking at what the learning sciences tell us and how we help all kids get to academic success. And we started with this idea that all kids deserve the opportunity to learn and they bring in their individual experiences. So as we think about learner variability, we designed a system that places them into, the, a child is placed into My Math Academy through a series of game-based assessments. So we don't come in and assume that everybody starts at the same place. Every child has a different, a different prior knowledge. They come in with different life experiences. They're gonna affect where they are. And we're talking about four or five year olds. So my math academy starts with a child with no knowledge of math and takes them to the second grade level. So we look at learning as a, as a continuity. So it's not just grade based. You're ex expected to know this at this age. It's how do you get to where you need to be to be proficient and uh, over, over, over a series of time. We started with a very learner-centric approach, and um, a big part of the whole child, uh, being a part of that ecosystem, is understanding who that child is and what they're capable of in terms of interaction with, with, with our product, our software. And so extensive amounts of developmental testing along the way from, uh, from prototype to final product, lots of look, you know, bringing kids into the office, seeing how they interact with our platform, and then for after that, you know, large scale efficacy tests in, in, in communities that are typically underserved. So um, uh, South Central LA in the Watts community, we, we ran an RCT in 2017. 
uh, an additional RCT in 2019 as well, where we, we found that our program can accelerate learning. And, and, for, and that all can, it really bring to what uh, the other panelists are saying is that we can solve or help solve for the academic piece of, of the child's learning. In addition, we have really focused as, as we think about continuous innovation is in terms of how do we empower the other adults in understanding who that child is, where they are in their learning trajectory. And a lot of what we've been working on in this last year has been focused on the, the teacher engagement and parent engagement. So understanding where a child is on their learning trajectory and then enabling the adult in the room, whether teacher or parent, to see where that child is, see what they know, and then offer opportunities for them to be for provide encouragement in terms of, wow, you learned this thing. Isn't that great? You're doing a great job. Um, as well as to, to provide them coaching tools so that they can they can bring in other aspects of the learning, help them transfer it to new and novel situations is something that we're also very much focused on. So we're working with our partners now. In this last year, we had this incredible result in, uh, in a pilot we ran in Harlingen, Texas, where we had nearly 1,000 four-year-olds that were on a pilot with, our, with my math academy. And this was in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, we were able to get it uh, up and running and teachers trained for, for my math academy. Um, this is in October, and the results have been tremendous. Uh, they, the, the, the school or the, the district previously had a uh, deficit in terms of math education for their youngest learners. With my math academy, the, the end result, and there's a, a great board meeting where the, one of the lead principals from, uh, from, the, from the school, uh, one of the, school the, uh, the school with the most kids at risk, uh, almost 70% of that school had uh, the children at risk, talked about how not only were they accelerating their learning, they were flourishing. They identified themselves as learners. They identified themselves as math learners, which is really hard to do. And the national conversation is about all the gaps. And what we believe is we're on helping unlock the potential with the adults in the community so that they understand that their kids can learn, they're capable of it. And, the, and yeah, that, that's what I got to say. Yeah. <laughs> so when we close on time, but you, you mentioned something really critical. You talked about being learner-centric um, in the design process. So what does that look and feel like? as you're developing an ed tech tool like that? Sure, um, we, we, as I mentioned, it's bringing the kids in, watching them interact with our product and seeing, does it work for them? You know, do they, and it's beyond just, do they understand the, the user interface? Is how do they react? Are they engaged? Are they, you know, do they smile? Do they, do they read along? Do they play along? Do, really helping understand and, 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 and seeing how they, um, they thrive using our product. And that's, you know, on, in, in the immediate development on a day-to-day -day basis as we bring these children in. And then over time, as we, you know, observe the usage in classroom and collect data back from, uh, from, our, from our, our research that we do or our studies, um, we've done two RCTs, as I mentioned, and not only do we, have we seen acceleration in learning, we have seen teachers Teachers tell us uh, that they, we've increased child, the child's confidence in learning math and, and generally identifying as a learner. And so it, it's, a, you know, it's, it's all about continuous innovation and, and continue to research and see how we're impacting the child in, in, in the classroom. Thank you. And I just went to a panel before this one where Christina on our team was, had a, was a research uh, industry um, and of course, practitioner collaboration on developing solutions, I think is critical and this kind of inclusive innovation. So very quickly, last thing I have um, in giving out time is if anyone is looking to embark on this kind of work, what's one advice you would give to them based on your experience? We'll go down the line and start with you, Christina. Um, I, think, I think the thing that we wanna have be different in education is that we design with, not for people, so that we engage all stakeholders and the community in the change process. Um, and so I think really starting there with designing with and not telling people this is the outcome, this is the way to do it, but let's talk about it together and have that shared commitment and vision um, at the outset is most important. Thank you. Yeah. Similar to what Christina shared, I would say ask. Right, so you're asking what the, in, the needs are, what, what they want. 
um, and what and and also ask what is the capacity of the school, right? Because sometimes you can have these really grand ideas, and you know, I think change, small change over time, creates consistency over time, which will create trust. And I think it's most important that when we're implying that we're supporting the whole child, that we are able to deliver on that promise and uh, create a foundation of trust for our for the all stakeholders involved. Thank you. I would say, um, similar to the other two panelists, is looking at it as from an ecosystem perspective. So what is our role as, for example, a software provider in this ecosystem? And in addition to serving the child, we're serving the teachers and the parents and, and, and really helping develop their roles as someone who is a, um, who is a advocate for that child. Thank you. So I'll build on what everyone said, which is arrive at your community based with and how. I mean, why? But then don't start from scratch. Like there is a lot already out there. There's so much work to be done. Don't reinvent the wheel. Transcend is working on building a library of models. So we have the Whole Child Collaborative that comes out of Van Ness. And by the way, Cynthia Robinson Rivers has, she's there in the back of the room if you want to ask more about Van Ness. But the same thing applies to other models. Don't build from scratch, build off of what others have already done. Thank you. Cynthia, are you here? Raise your hand. <laughs> if you want to find a four drink later, so this is Cynthia. Um, a hand for our panelists. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>